Thank you very much, Aaron, and thanks for putting my Thank you. question for right here. I thought everybody would be sick of uh, looking at slides, so I actually brought some uh, real material here. Get in touch with me. I know. Okay. Oh, trick. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Aaron, and uh, I'd like to kind of get started here on uh, what Aaron told me when I first contacted him with this uh, new species that we described about a year and a half ago, and his response was pretty much typical, although very diplomatic compared to a lot of folks. He said, I thought we knew everything there was about helianthus and sunflowers, and that's the general response that uh, we got uh, numerous times we went through describing this uh, particular plant, but then uh, a real feeling and response of uh, 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 incredulous uh, people, like, how could that be? Where did you find it? And, you know, how has it existed all this time right there? Uh, and it's not some little belly plant that you're crawling around uh, in a vertical pool and you happen to run across. It's very ephemeral. This is a woody perennial that blooms year round. So how could that be? So let's take a look at this. Uh, all right. uh, this is the uh, abstract from the publication about a, a year and a half ago that I did with my associates, uh, Chris Mitchell, John Constable, and Craig State. And, okay, how's that, better? <laughs> okay, and uh, it's uh, described only from two counties, southern Fresno County and northern Tulare County in the uh, southern Sierra Nevada foothills of California, immediately east of the San Joaquin Valley, on the very edge of the valley, in a very narrow altitudinal range. And um, it only is found on south-facing slopes, uh, in ungrazed, very rocky conditions, but in very visible sites. And so um, we decide, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to, like, how can we, uh, you know, describe this? We thought, well, we'll go back a little bit and, and take some lessons from the man himself, the botany man, Jepson, uh, the most famous botanist in California. And uh, we've all subscribed to his uh, admonition, I think. Uh, we want to go to the cool places. And he always, uh, you've all seen his uh, quote from Kipling, something lost beyond the ranges. So we go to the highest mountains, we go to the cool, uh, out of the way botanical hotspots, of course, like some of the field trips that are planned here. We go to the serpentine, we go to the vernal pools, we go to the inaccessible areas because we're looking for those really cool plants, uh, the ones that we know might be a new species or something like that and maybe we're overlooking what's right there in our own backyard. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, I'll say, and I'll show later, that uh, this species, winter eye, uh, is, uh, uh, has evolved from the common Helianthus annuus, a definitive genetic work that uh, demonstrate this, a relatively recent evolutionary uh, offshoot. By recent, I mean within the last few thousand years. But let's look at uh, maybe a little bit of the history and how, how could something like this uh, uh, be overlooked and pass under the radar. Jepson himself said that uh, um, it was obviously, he said, introduced from the Great Plains region. You know, he just assumed it was, like I'm sure everyone did, and we all did, because hey, it's all over the Great Plains and here it is. Later, he actually collected, in 1939, um, annuals at a location which is on Kings Canyon Highway and Clovis Avenue down in Clovis. On his way to Kings Canyon, he collected annuals, And then, immediately his next collection was in Grant Grove up in Kings Canyon where he collected a pyrola. So he went right through the type locality where it's abundant on both sides of a route that has been there for about 120 years. Uh, Quabell in 1953 collected a plant that he described as uh, annuous, but it was flowering later than usual. His notes, uh, it's from January 53, he described it as uh, 
plants are flowering here later, even after all the plants in the valley are dead. We know that annuals, we see it all over. First frost, it's gone, right? And he said, well, I've seen it here flowering pretty late, but he didn't make the connection that it was a perennial. This was deposited at RSA and then put in the undetermined uh, file for the next uh, 50, 60 years. Munns and Keck, they said it's roadside and waste areas, my favorite term, sometimes ruderal, uh, growing all, along the, all over the place, of course, we see it. Uh, Abrams and Ferris, widespread, uh, widespread weed, uh, uh, several variations, which we know there are a lot of different uh, annual sunflowers out there, uh, some cultivated, some ornamental. Rousseau from St. Mary's College on Cal Photo posted a photo in 1980, uh, from 1982 that uh, uh, was taken of uh, this new species at the type locality. But he didn't, uh, he, he collected it at the time of the year, annuus would be out, he didn't make the connection that it was uh, a perennial either. Um, and then of course in uh, TJM1, uh, we finally got around to saying and recognizing, yes, it's a native species at least. And then in uh, TJM2, um, uh, the description, because we were working on it then and they were aware of it, uh, Keel put the note at the end that a woody subshrub from the southern Sierra Nevada foothills may be a new species. So that's kind of remember the chronology there, if you will. Uh, the important thing is to remember 14 species of Helianthus in California. This new one is extremely uh, distinctive and unique, you'll see from the photos and the data. And it's genetically unique, uh, and it's extremely distinct morphologically and anatomically. And it's very unusual in that it flowers continuously. As you know, very few uh, California natives flower continuously. Some do, but by and large, it's plants from uh, the uh, southern latitudes that will flower uh, continuous. This thing will flower. We've got photos of flowering in the occasional low elevations uh, snowfall. <clears throat> this is the known range of. Uh, let's see if I can see this. There we go. Right here, Northern Tulare, Southern Fresno County. Very, very limited range. Right on the edge of the San Joaquin Valley, the lowest foothills to meet. As soon as you get out of the valley, uh, undoubtedly. It, it was in the valley before the advent of modern uh, agriculture, which is a, a, you know, essentially 100% of the valley until you get to the hills, and even then some on the hills. So it's a very, very narrow range, approximately eight or nine populations within a very narrow range, all on private lands. Um, the type locality is this northern one here which is on Highway 180 in Fresno County, one half mile uh, the minute you leave the valley. And then it's only for about a half to three quarters of a mile before it tends to die out in terms of altitude. We think it's related to uh, frost intolerance. Since then, we found, you remember I mentioned Corbell's collection up here, right by below Pine Flat Dam, right there below Fresno County. And there's one small population of just a remnant uh, where it occurs there. We have looked in, uh, up and down similar habitat, north and south, mostly south, all the way down to the Kern River Canyon, and we have not find, found any other uh, uh, populations. We put the word out on um, the botanical radar, too, and nobody's uh, uh, found it down in there yet. Okay, here's our typical habitat of winter up. Extremely rocky, ungrazed south-facing slopes on the very edge of the valley. You can see the numerous plants out there um, up in here and even some are blooming. This is last year which is the you know one of the driest years on record. You can see that although it's ungrazed the uh, um, there was even no herbaceous germination uh, associated with it. This was like March of last year. It was just it, the worst year I've ever seen it down in there. And yet, here's the plant. A bunch of it's grown. Some of it dies back and it comes back from the base again, which incidentally, here's the plant. 
No, that's some other tree. Right, <laughs> <laughs> sure. exactly. And uh, uh, let's see, and then, okay, here's some other, the typical habitat. Almost always the large mature plants, the woody ones that make it that far, are at the base of a major rock. We think it uh, affords a little extra uh, water retention and runoff, as well as solar insulation uh, and perhaps a little bit of protection, but always on these steep rocky slopes. And again, the, some of these rocky slopes are where the ranchers don't want to put their cattle, so it's fortuitous to get. Okay, you can see again, different times of the year blooming uh, continuously here. Here is a typical setting also. You can see the threats that it faces right on the edge of the valley in what's known as the San Joaquin citrus belt. And they say that because it's almost 100% devoted to citrus. This is just east of Orange Cove in southern uh, Fresno County. Here's the plant. There's a citrus orchard which to say it's heavily managed is a, a, a real understatement. And, um, uh, and what's interesting on, on uh, this is that over in here, down here along the edge of these orchards and whatnot, in the spring we'll find seedlings of winter eye. Of course, they get wiped out by all the activities and so forth. But you can see the, uh, uh, the adjacent uh, threats and activities that go on uh, uh, right near its very narrow range. And this was uh, uh, last year or two in January. You can see you had a little bit of germination there. And it's blooming in January. Crazy thing. Um, uh, uh, well, incident, I'll show you later. The, uh, the gentleman we named this for, Bob Winter, longtime uh, biology instructor in Fresno, <coughs> who was aware of it and bothered me for 20 years, said, when are you going to do something with this plant? He, uh, he, he, he knew there was something different about it, but it was my job to actually uh, uh, describe it. Um, oh, I wanted to point out one thing in terms of the threat, the biggest threat to this plant and some of the other rare plants down in that area would be the, uh, the advent of frying dams so they could get water down the east side of the San Joaquin Valley and the technology of inventing drip irrigation because they want to plant the citrus on these lowest hills so you get cold air drainage away from it and you don't get the frost. Okay. Uh, here's another typical setting. This is southernmost population on Boyd Road in Tulare County occupying a very narrow uh, niche, if you will, uh, above the spray zone of a road, but uh, below uh, anywhere that it could be grazed. In this case, you notice in the background, um, right up here, that hillside, exactly the same habitat, the difference being a fence line up here, and this is really grazed up in there, and we don't find any, okay? So, uh, we'll keep moving along here as fast as we can. Here's Quibell's remnant population down in Fresno County that we found that he described as annuous, one little teeny piece of this, I would say that's a rural area that it's growing in. Here's the hillside in back of it where he described it as occurring in 1953, none up there, uh, just a little bit down below it here, and you can see this was last year, and there's the large plant with its large, uh, huge stem there. Uh, here's a plant that is growing next to a citrus orchard below the foothills where it occurs, got a little extra water, and you can see how good it's doing. And, it, and actually, from an ornamental standpoint, could be uh, uh, kind of pretty, you know. <clears throat> okay, here's the genetics work that Brooke Moyers up in uh, UBC is doing. Basically, long story short, the, the basic genome of anguis and winter eye are very close, but a tremendous more amount of variation in winter eye in terms of gene expression. And so who knows what that means, it, 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 but it's, in, it's interesting to the geneticists and the uh, folks at USDA who are growing it, or uh, you know, they're, they're thinking of uh, obviously some of the genetics extraction that they can do. Here's a close-up of the flower, you see them that they can do. Here's a close-up of the flower, you see the dark purple filaries. Here's a seedling, first year seedling. They, some survive a frost, a lot don't. But that's why we think that at the base of a, um, um, the rocks provide some protection. But the seedling is virtually 
undetectable from uh, or distinguishable from annulus. <coughs> Here's the plant in its glory. This was from the publication. You can see it. This is the same plant on the top, two and a half years apart. Here's March. Here's the plant. Here it is tagged over here. October. This is 2008, 2010, October. The exact same plant again growing at the base <coughs> of the rock. Here's the big woody stem like you see here. Here's a cross section through the stem of about a 16 to 18 year old uh, plant. <coughs> Pretty phenomenal. A lot of physiological work, USDA and John Constable have been doing on them. Long story short, they're very, very close. Smaller leaf and winter eye. Uh, photosynthetic output, they almost identical. Uh, the uh, foliar chemistry, very similar, except total phenolics, whatever that means. Uh, who knows, but USDA is interested in it. Uh, same with foliar chemistry. All right, so how did this happen? We say we all have, among other species, maybe some helianthus blindness, because we're used to seeing helianthus in these kind of settings, ditches, uh, roadsides, uh, rural waste areas. So I decided, you know, and Bruce uh, Baldwin from Jefferson Herbarium, when he saw it, he coined uh, oblivious to the obvious statement, which I thought was kind of nice. So I decided, what do we do about this? I had to get inspiration. So I went back to see the man himself. And he communicated to me, he basically inspired me to go read his works again. And I did. I read his notes. This is kind of interesting here. If you look real close on his notes, it says, if lost, please return to P.O. Box Berkeley and get a, re and get a reward <laughs> if you, you can return it. But he basically said, be accurate. So I looked at his more his latest works, and here's the last collection that Jepson ever collected. Can you believe it? What is it? Sal Sola, the most common weed in the state. But he put great detail, his drawing in it. That's his last collection from Antioch. And the detail that he put in, uh, at the time there was only one species, and a lot of us thought only one species of tumbleweed. Now there are eight. And the one he described here, just from his measurements and his accurate description, was uh, uh, apparently pulsonized, so solar pulsonized. So anyway, that's it. Uh, conclusion is we should focus on all native species, not just those cool little uh, showy ones or the remote ones or you know the ones way out there, but uh, be observant, accurate documentation, no substitute for it, and that there probably are, that a plant like this is probably worthy of uh, it certainly being, it is rare, and it's worthy of our conservation efforts as much as a plant that might be, you know, up on the top of Clouds Rest in Yosemite or some, someplace like that. Okay. And uh, I acknowledge all these folks, especially Laura Merrick at USDA, she's got thousands of these growing back at the uh, Sunflower Genetics Lab in Ames, Iowa. And um, anyway, that's it. If there's time for any question, I'll be glad to answer.